So this video is a full summary of all the things you need to know about atomic structure for National 5. So atomic structure deals with the elements in the periodic table. Now an element is a substance made from only one type of atom. There are 118 elements that exist, with the most recent one being discovered in 2016. And elements are organised into a now the periodic table is split into columns and rows. We call the columns groups and we call the rows periods. Okay, so columns are rows, uh, columns are groups and rows are periods. Now every element in the same group, that is the same column, will have similar chemical properties. And the periodic table can be split into a few different ways. The main one you need to know is where is the boundary between metals and non-metals. So I'm going to draw that on. Metals and non-metals, there is a staircase uh, that is drawn there, and it should also be on your data booklets where there is a thick black line. Everything on the top right is a non-metal. Everything, this big section, those are your metals. So you can see the majority of elements are metals. It's only those small ones, hydrogen, and then everything at the top and right hand side are your non-metals. There are a few groups that we in more detail. So group one are alkali metals and alkali metals are our most reactive metals. They are soft um, and can be cut easily, but they are so reactive that they react with water. The next group we need to know is that group second from the right at the end, what we call group seven, are the halogens. Now, they are similar to the alkali metals in that they are very reactive, except because they are on the right hand side, they are non-metals. So halogens, group seven, are very reactive non-metals. We then have the group on the very right hand side, group eight or group zero, are the noble gases. What we need to know about noble gases is that they are inert, or unreactive, they do not do reactions. They exist as one atom on its own, and the term for that is monatomic or monoatomic. And the reason they are unreactive is because they are stable. Finally, we have a block in the middle, which is labeled in your data booklet as metals. These, um, are a collection of metals with similar properties. They form colored ions, they can be used as catalysts, and often they are the day-to-day -day metals that you would have heard of. So iron, platinum, gold, titanium are all transition metals. Now, whenever we say that atoms are made, um, that elements are made up of one type of atom, we also need to know that atoms themselves are made of smaller particles. So the smaller particles that make up an atom are called protons, neutrons, and electrons. You need to know these names. Now the protons, neutrons, and electrons are not all found in the same part of an atom. The central part called the nucleus is where you find the protons and neutrons, and the electrons are around the outside in layers called electron shells or energy levels. You do need to know the word nucleus, and you will need to know that the electrons are found in shells or in energy levels. Each of these particles has their own mass, charge, and location. You can be asked to fill out a table like this at National 5, with some of the bits filled in, and you need to be able to fill in the rest. So if you can do the whole thing, that's going to make you very prepared. So protons have a mass of one. P -p -p protons are p -p -p positive and they have a charge of positive one and they are found in the nucleus. 
neutrons have a mass of one. Neutrons have no charge. No charge means neutral, which is where we get the word neutron from. And neutrons are found in the nucleus. And finally, we have electrons. Those are the ones that have the most differences compared to the other ones. Electrons have a mass of almost zero, and it is okay for us to say zero, but it is almost zero. They have a charge of negative one, and they are found in the electron shells or energy levels. Now, every atom can be written in what is called nuclide notation. In nuclide notation, what we have is we have the symbol for the element, which we can find from the periodic table, and then it will also have two numbers written on it. The smaller of the numbers is always the atomic number, and it is usually written at the bottom of the symbol on the left-hand side. The larger of the two numbers is the mass number. Mass number is usually written at the top left-hand side. However, you will sometimes see the atomic number and the mass number switched around. You just need to remember the mass number is always the bigger number. Now, the atomic number, remember that is the smaller of the two numbers written beside an element, that tells us the number of protons in the element. So if it has an atomic number of one, it has one proton. If it has an atomic number of 13, it has 13 protons. Now, when it comes to atoms, atoms have no overall charge. They have a charge of zero. Now, the only way you can end up with a charge of zero is if the number of positive protons and the number of negative electrons are the same as one another so that they cancel each other's charges out and bring the charge back to zero. So in an atom that has no charge, the atomic number tells us the number of protons, which is also the number of electrons. But this is only true for atoms with no charge. Finally, we have the mass number and the mass number tells us the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And so if we know the atomic number, which tells us the number of protons, we could also say that the mass number is equal to the atomic number plus the number of neutrons. Now, one thing you can be asked to do with the atomic number and the mass number is do pen calculations where PEN stands for proton, electron, and neutrons. We can always work out the number of protons because that is always equal to the atomic number. If it is a neutral atom, the number of electrons is going to be the same as the number of protons because the atom has no charge. And the neutrons, we can always work out the number of neutrons by having the mass number and taking the atomic number away from it. So mass number minus or subtract or take away the atomic number. That is your big number minus your small number. An example here for aluminium. It has a mass number of 27, it has an atomic number of 13. Protons equals atomic number, so that's 13. Electrons are the same as protons because this atom has no charge. And so electrons are also 13. Our neutrons will be our mass number, our big number, minus our small number, which is 27 minus 13, which gives us 14 neutrons. On page six of your data booklet is where you will find something called your electron arrangement. At the bottom of each box for each element, <coughs> you'll see a sequence of numbers. It's that sequence of numbers that is the electron arrangement. The number of numbers in that sequence tells you how many shells there are around the nucleus. And the value of each number tells you how many electrons to draw in each shell. So if we look at potassium, it has an atomic number of 19 and it has 19 electrons. 
the electron arrangement is 2, 8, 8, 1. There are four numbers, so that would mean when we're drawing potassium, we would need to draw four shells. In the first shell, that's the one closest to the nucleus, we would put two electrons. We would draw eight in the second shell, eight in the third shell, and one in the fourth shell, what we would call the outer electron shell. How we would see that? We've got our electron arrangement, we draw a nucleus in the middle, or you can put the symbol for the element in the middle instead. First shell, two electrons. Second shell, eight electrons. Fourth shell, sorry, third shell, eight electrons. And our fourth and final shell, one electron. That is it. Now the electron arrangement, yes, we can be asked to draw it out, but we can also use it to give us information. The number of shells, that an element has tells you what period of the periodic table it is in. The final number, which is the number of um, electrons in the outer shell, tells you what group an element is in. So chlorine has an electron arrangement 2, 8, 7. Three numbers, so three shells, which means it's in period 3. The final number is 7, so it's in group 7. Boron, electron arrangement 2, 3. Two shells, so period 2. Three electrons in the outer shell, so it's in group 3. So far, we've talked about atoms that had no charge. As soon as an atom gains a charge, we call it an ion. And the reason why atoms become ions is so that they become more stable. And an atom is stable when it has a full outer shell of electrons. And for most electron shells, that number of electrons that makes it stable is eight. The exception is shell number one, which can only have two electrons in it. How do atoms become ions? Well, they become ions by gaining or losing electrons. And as soon as they have gained or lost electrons, they will no longer have the same number of protons and electrons as one another. So, electrons have a negative charge. If you gain electrons, you will gain negative charge. So if you gain one electron, you will have a charge of one negative. If you gain three electrons, you will have a charge of three negative. Now, if you lose electrons, you are getting rid of negative things, which makes you positive. So if you lose one electron, you become one positive. If you lose two electrons, you become two positive. So let's look at atoms and how they would turn into ions. The first atom we're going to look at is sodium. Now, its electron arrangement is 2, 8, 1. To become stable, we want an outer shell of eight electrons. Sodium has two possible ways of doing this. It could gain seven electrons and turn the final number into an eight, or lose one electron so that the new final number is that second number eight in the list. Atoms are lazy, so they are going to take the easy option, which in this case is losing one electron. So after we've lost that electron, <coughs> the new electron arrangement will be 2, 8. How has sodium become an ion? It has lost one electron. Its charge will be one positive. And when something is one positive, we just need to put a positive charge. We do not need the number one. Add another option. This is sulfur going from an atom to an ion. When sulfur is an atom, its electron arrangement is 2, 8, 6. Remember, stability means an outer shell of eight electrons. So for sulfur, its two possible options are gaining two electrons or losing six electrons. And again, atoms are lazy, they will take the easy option. 
Gaining two is easier than losing six, so it will gain two electrons. Its new electron arrangement as an ion will be two, eight, eight. Because it has gained two electrons, it will have a charge of two minus, and we draw the charge on the top right hand side, number before sign. When it comes to pen calculations, we have to use the charge to help us work out the number of electrons. So in a positive ion, you have, um, you will have lost electrons. So your number of electrons is going to be your atomic number minus the number of electrons you have lost, okay? So the atomic number minus the number of electrons lost. And in this case, because it's three positive, it will have lost three electrons. So doing our pen calculation, our proton is the atomic number, so it's 13. Our electrons is going to be our atomic number minus 3, because if it's positive, it's lost electrons. 13 minus 3 gives us 10 electrons. And then our neutrons, exactly the same as before, mass number minus atomic number, 27 minus 13, which is 14. Example of a negative ion. The, this time, it is going to be the atomic number plus the number of electrons gained. So for this, protons, atomic number, never changes, eight. The electrons, it's going to be the atomic number plus two because we've gained two electrons to become negatively charged. So eight plus two is 10. And our neutrons is our mass number, big number, minus atomic number, small number, 60 minus 8, which is 8. The final thing we need to know about for atomic structure is isotopes. Now, the definition of isotopes <coughs> are atoms of the same element that have the same atomic number, but different mass numbers. You need to be able to give that definition. Isotopes are atoms with the same atomic number, but different mass number. And we can see in these two copper atoms, they have the same atomic number at 29, but one of them has a mass number of 63, one of them has a mass number of 65. Why do they have different mass numbers? Another question that is very commonly asked, they have different numbers of neutrons, okay? Um, when it comes to isotopes, because you have multiple different mass numbers, it means that elements that have isotopes need something called a relative atomic mass, which gives you the average mass of all the different isotopes. The relative atomic mass does not need to be a whole number. And in fact, the relative atomic mass is usually very close to one of the particular isotopes itself. Whichever isotope has its mass closest to the relative atomic mass is the isotope we have more of. So in this example, argon, it has a relative or average atomic mass of 36.2. We look at the three isotopes. The most common one is going to be the one who has a number, a mass number closest to this average mass or relative mass, which is going to be our argon 36. So that has been everything we need to know about atomic structure, and we can leave it there.